Quick question before we get started. Who had their normal cup of coffee this morning? Maybe one, maybe two. Yes, coffee drinkers? Casey, two hands up probably. Yes, yes. We love our coffee. And like, like everything else over the years, coffee has gone up. I remember as a young kid in the mid-70s, the average price of, cup, of a cup of coffee in a restaurant was about 25 cents. Now, coffee is usually priced somewhere between 2 or $3 and much more for those specialty drinks, right? Like caramel macchiatos at Starbucks or McDonald's, for example. And another thing about coffee. Back in the day, nobody considered drinking coffee cold. It was hot or nothing. Now you have a choice. Hot coffee or an ice cold coffee drink. So, let me ask you this question. Would you rather drink a hot cup of coffee or a, that, or an ice cold cup of coffee? What would you rather do? Hot, hot, hot. Anybody for cold, hot? Both. Both, it doesn't matter, as long as it's caffeine and coffee. It doesn't matter. That's right. Cold? Have some cold folks out there. Okay. Well, what they haven't moved to yet is lukewarm coffee. <laughs> Starbucks doesn't offer any lukewarm coffee specialty coffee drinks, at least none that I'm aware of. And nobody pours a cup of coffee, a hot cup, and then purposely lets it sit there on the counter for an hour for it to become good and lukewarm before they drink it, right? Nobody does that. Well, today we're going to come to the last of the seven churches that we're studying in this book of Revelation. We started in Ephesus, and we moved north, and now we've come back down south, and we're going to end with the church in Laodicea. And it's been a fun journey. I've really, really enjoyed being able to preach through these churches with you. And some of you are probably already thinking about different studies of Laodicea that you've completed in the past, like don't be a lukewarm Christian, obviously not. Be hot or cold, don't, be, don't just sit on the fence. So today we're going to look at things, which are all true statements, but today we're going to look at things from a little different angle. Because there's a lot more to that little letter than we might realize. It's very applicable to our lives. It's very applicable to our thoughts and our relationship with Jesus Christ. It's a good way to conclude this series on the seven churches. But before we go any further, let's set the stage a little bit. Let's look at the context so we can get a good picture in our mind as we read this letter in just a few minutes. So, as we've already mentioned a couple times in these past seven weeks, the most important aspect of real estate is location, location, location. So, Laodicea is located in the modern country of Turkey, and as you can see, it formed a triangle with a couple other cities in the Lycus River Valley. To the north was Hierapolis, and it was a military city. It was an old military town. And then to its east, I guess, of Laodicea was Colossae. And that might be familiar because we have the book in the Bible, Colossians. It was a letter written to the Christians there in Colossae. And in, in Laodicea, that city was very, very wealthy. It was a, they were really, really rich. Um, super rich. A matter of fact, this picture shows you a little, gives you a little perspective on the main, main road, main street, let's just call it, where there were shops on each side and bustling activity, commerce going on. Very, very wealthy. For example, in 60 AD, an earthquake hit this entire region. Those other two cities, well, all three of those cities were pretty much destroyed. And Rome offered to bail them out. Said, let me give you some money to rebuild. A couple of them took Rome up on the offer, but not Laodicea. They said, eh, we don't need your money. They said, we've got this, and they did. See, much of their wealth was, was, it was a result of the banking industry that was centered there in Laodicea. It was the banking center for this province of Asia Minor, and it included a gold exchange which contributed to their wealth. Also, they were known for their medicine, in particular, a special eye salve that was supposed to cure blindness. And people came from all over the area to buy this salve. Also, they had rich nutrient soil, which helped produce a natural black wool for the sheep. And as a result, when they, when they made their clothing, it was a beautiful black, stylish coats and things that the people in Laodicea were known for, their wool, their black wool clothing. So with all this wealth, with medicine, the ice have, with the clothing industry, what's one thing that they didn't have? One thing they didn't have, any guesses? They didn't have water. 
They didn't have water. Because remember that town up to the north, Heropolis? They would pipe, they had some hot springs up there. So they would pipe the hot water down to Laodicea in a series of aqueducts and pipes. And in the town Colossae, they had some cold springs there. And they would try to pipe that water to Laodicea from Colossae. But by the time it reached Laodicea, what do you think was the hotter? Was the water hot? Was the water cold? No, you're right. It was lukewarm. So with that in context, let's dig in and see what Jesus speaks into this passage. And he says this in Revelation 3, 14 through 16. To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, The Amen, the faithful and true witness, the origin of the creation of God says this. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will vomit you out of my mouth. You know, as we read on in just a little bit here, we're going to see that these Laodiceans, they, they're a church that thinks they have it all figured out. That, you know, look at our magnificent city. Look at our magnificent buildings. Look at our well-organized ministries. It's the type of church that would send a letter to other churches telling them how to do church. But in this letter, Jesus says, Let's just stop the presses for a minute. And Christ jumps right in, and he addresses this arrogant attitude in the, right in the beginning of the letter with these powerful words and a description of who he is. He says, these are the words of the amen. He says, these are the faithful. I'm the faithful and true witness, the origin of God's creation. I think Jesus just wants us to remember who he is, who he is. You know, our view of Jesus directly relates to our worship of him. And within these passages, passages of Revelation, there's been so many beautiful descriptions of Jesus. In the first few chapters, we've read that he walks among the lampstands. He's the first and the last. He's the one who died and came back to life. He's the one who has the sharp, double-edged sword. He's the one who has eyes like blazing fire. He holds the key of David that we talked about last week. And here he's described as the amen. What does that mean? Amen means let it be so. So be it. What Jesus is going to tell this church, it will come to pass. Because this passage also tells us he's a true and faithful witness. In Jesus, there's no deceit. There's no falsehoods. He will tell you exactly how it is. Kind of like that junior high student years ago who stopped me right in the middle of a lesson and said, Wow, Mark, are you hot? And I said, he goes, Because you have some huge sweat rings underneath your arms. <laughs> Brutally honest. There you go. So, so far in this sermon series, I've revealed I'm a little stinky at times, and now I'm a little sweaty at times. So now you, there's the combination right there. So what is Jesus trying to express to these Laodiceans by describing himself in this way? He's about to reveal truth. He's about to reveal to them their spiritual condition. Buckle up, Laodiceans, because here it comes. Now, the truth, it's going to be a little painful for them, and it might be a little painful for us sometimes. But the sting of Jesus' words, they're leading somewhere. right? He wants to accomplish something with them. But for now, he just lays out his credentials. He's the ruler of God's creation. And as Christians, like, like those in Laodicea, we serve him. But the problem is that these ancient believers in Laodicea, they weren't acting like it. And we need to be on guard to make sure that we don't fall into that trap as well. So as we stated, they were very, very wealthy. They had successful banks. They had a huge wool industry to go along with their medicine and other endeavors. They were so comfortable, they acted like they really didn't need the Lord Jesus Christ in their lives. He was an accessory to them. He was a supplement as they controlled their own destiny. And if this describes you today, if you identify as a believer, a follower of Christ, a Christian, but you have this attitude that you really don't need or want Christ to control your life, to fully submit to him. If you're just kind of relying on him to keep you out of hell or give you the good things in life you think you deserve, 
then I think we probably want to listen closely to what he says to this type of attitude that we read in the scriptures this morning. Because according to Christ, in the scripture, you would be lukewarm, and that's disgusting to him. And he's about ready to spit you, to vomit you out of his mouth. Now, based on what we know about the water that we just looked at in Laodicea, do you think they understood this lukewarm figure of speech? Yes. He's saying, Christians in Laodicea, you're just like that water that you pipe in. And they would have gasped at that description. So, as I mentioned earlier, there's a couple ways to look at this hot and cold situation that Christ addresses here. The first is the traditional way to say and assume that hot is good, be on fire, cold is bad. But there's a problem with that because if that's true, Jesus is saying, I wish, he's talking to the church, I wish you were either hot or cold, really good or cold, really bad. And I don't think he'd want people in the church, his followers, to be really, really cold or bad in that sense. So what does it mean? If hot and cold doesn't represent good and bad, what does it mean? The, all, the other the alternative is this, that hot water, very useful, very useful, serves multiple purposes, a nice hot shower, a nice hot cup of coffee. I mean, when I was a kid, my mom would put hot water in a water bottle. I don't even know if they have those anymore, but have a little hot water bottle for tummy aches and stuff. Hot water is useful. Cold water, very useful too. Remember the times in summer when your parents would send you outside and they would say, now you don't come home until those street lights come on, right? I mean, get out there and do something. Go have fun. And you'd be with your friends, you'd get super hot and sweaty, and your friends would take a break, and you'd, you'd go over to the hose and turn it on so you could get a, a drink of nice cold water in the summertime, right? I mean, that was us, right? Generation Xers. We were raised on hose water and neglect, <laughs> right? That's what we were raised on. And now, now we even have a T-shirt to prove it, I think. Don't we, Chris? Yes. Raised on hose water and neglect. That's right. But you always had to at least be second in line for that hose, right? Because if you were the first one in, you rush in the first, you put that hose up to your mouth before it flushes out, what happens? Yeah, you get that hot plastic, hose-tasting water that's been baking in the sun all day in your mouth when you're expecting cold water. And what do you do? There's only one response. Blah! You spit it out. You have to let the hose run until it's cold, and then you get your drink. That's what Jesus is saying here in this passage. Hot water, useful. Cold water, useful. Lukewarm Christians, blah! There's no use for you. You know, back to our earlier analogy. Be hot coffee or iced coffee, but don't be that gross, lukewarm coffee with that weird film on top. <laughs> right? Don't be that. <laughs> it's an important message to hear because, because we too live in a wealthy society. Compared to the rest of the world, everybody in this room is very, very rich. And with that wealth, it's so easy to serve ourselves. Ourselves. And depend on ourselves rather than to serve and depend on Christ. So this application of lukewarmness this morning, it's directed at you and it's directed at me and my attitude and your attitude towards the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, the one redeeming quality that this church in Laodicea has is they show us examples of what to do if we want to be repulsive and useless to Christ. And we don't want to do that. Right? We don't want, we're going to go through them so we don't walk in them, obviously. So this, if anything we read here this morning describes us or you, we can repent, we can change, and we can become useful for the Lord. We don't want our Lord to vomit us out of his mouth. We don't want to do behavior that makes him sick to his stomach. You know, the question is, why is he vomiting out a Christian anyway? Well, let's read on. And we'll see the Laodiceans were a self-deceived church. He says this in chapter 3, 17 through 18. Because you say, I am rich and have become wealthy and have no need of anything, and you do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked, 
I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may have so that you may become rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourselves and the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed and I salve to apply to your eyes so that you may see. So over time, this church as a whole and individuals within became way too comfortable and prideful. They, say, I, they said, I am rich. The booming local economy, great opportunities, good jobs, good pay, big 401ks, the best medicine, the best looking clothes around. I mean, sometimes when you're in that comfort zone, it's hard to be to rely and give your life to Christ. And this attitude seemed to percolate up to the church as a whole as well. This passage said they had no need of anything. The church must have been in okay shape financially as well. The members of the church tithed and supported the church with their resources. Plenty of money saved up for a rainy day. Individually, they were comfortable. As a body, as a church, corporately, they were comfortable, yet they were lukewarm. So I wonder how many churches in the United States across our country are in the same comfort zone this morning. We must be careful. Jesus addressed this very issue in a story that we call the parable of the rich fool. Let's go through it just really briefly this morning. In Luke 12, 16, we read this. And he told them a parable saying, the land of a rich man was very productive. And he began thinking to himself, saying, What shall I do, since I have no place to store my crops? And he said, This is what I will do. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones, and I will store all my grain and my goods there. And I will say to myself, You have many goods stored up for many years to come. Relax, eat, drink, and enjoy yourself. But God said to him, You fool. This very night your soul is demanded of you. And as for all that you have prepared, who will own it now? Such is the one who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich in relation to God. That's pretty self-explanatory. So the next time we have a, a major decision to make, we have to ask ourselves, am I doing this for the glory of God and his kingdom? Or am I making this decision because it benefits me in the long run the most? We have to remember that Jesus, when he called his disciples, he said for them to deny themselves, to take up their cross, and to follow him. But unfortunately today, sometimes that message is twisted to become, to become a Christian so you can be happy, healthy, and wealthy. And that's just not true. I mean, actually, that's the path towards useless, lukewarm Christianity. And... Jesus' response to their pride, as we read in context of their culture, as we read in context of their culture, was, you think so? Well, let me tell you. You think you're rich? Well, you're poor. You're actually very poor. In verse 17, he called them poor, wretched, miserable, blind, and naked. So you might feel fancy in those black wool clothes that you make, but you're naked. And remember the medicine you're known for, that magic eye salve? You're blind. So many in our culture experience the exact same spiritual blindness. You know, the U.S. dollar says what? We all know what it says. In God we trust. Yet money is typically the one God people trust in more than God himself. So as I mentioned earlier, a passage like this should make us all kind of step back and ask ourselves, what am I currently chasing after right now in life? Right now, this moment, what am I chasing after? We're all chasing after something. Is it worth it? Is it out of my desire to better serve him for his glory, for his kingdom? Or is, am I chasing after something for me and myself? Because what we're really talking about here with the Laodiceans and, and, and some of us possibly at the root is an unwilling to sacrifice. A lukewarm Christian is one who makes Jesus a hobby, not their life's work. See, many like the fact that Jesus sacrificed his life for ours, yet we dare not return the favor. And one thing that's, that's really evident throughout all of scripture is following Jesus must be done his way. 
He needs to be the one driving the car, not in the passenger seat, along for the ride. And Jesus is pointing out this fundamental reality to them, reality to them in this passage. In verse 18, he says, I have so much more for you. Take my gold. Remember the gold exchange? He said, take my gold. My gold's refined in fire. And it's actually worth something, right? It's going to offer you that eternal security you long for rather than the false security of your banks. He says, you're rich in Christ, the source of everything. He said, go reread that. He says, take my white robes to cover your nakedness and your shame. Regarding your blindness, I'm the real healing salve. He's the one who can help you see what you truly need. And what we need, all of us, is just more of him every day in our lives. So Jesus addresses and goes after the things that the Laodiceans really trusted in more than God. Their wealth and their stuff. Jesus will always be after the thing or things that sit on the throne of our heart other than him. So where we're unwilling to sacrifice reveals where we feel we don't need God. So let's conclude this section with one glaring application is this. That God, I don't think, and you know, God won't settle for anything less than being top priority of your life. He wants you to be actively pursuing him, not a hobby, but as a way of life. And if we do so, then we just see the love of Christ come shining through. So let's read on and see what Jesus tells them in verses 19 through 22. For those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and, I, and we'll dine with him, and he with me. The one who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat with my father on his throne. The one who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So Jesus, out of love, is rebuking and he's disciplining this church in Laodicea. For what purpose? So that... They will earnestly, wholeheartedly repent and turn from that lukewarmness. I mean, we feel pretty comfortable with rebuke and discipline in certain contexts, right? Like, for example, coaches, teachers, parents, not our own, maybe other parents. You know, if they bring rebuke and discipline, it's okay that we applaud coaches for a well-disciplined team. They won that game because they were well-disciplined. And the announcer will say they lost that team because they lacked discipline. You know, a teacher in a classroom, we want discipline in the classroom. But God, with us, I don't know, he, he's loving, right? He's kind. He's not a disciplinarian, is he? Well, God is love. And indeed, he is kind. And that's exactly why he disciplines those he loves. The most unloving thing God could do is not to rebuke or discipline us and let us carry on in our sinful behavior. See, Jesus will discipline and rebuke us out of his love because it's the only way out of this lukewarm pattern of behavior. Because it leads us to change, repentance. It leads us to restoration. It's an opportunity to experience the love of God. It really is a beautiful thing. It won't feel like it when you're going through some moment where God seems to be disciplining you, discipline, disciplining you, but it really is beautiful. It shows us the character of God, how much he loves us. And it's really been that way from the very, very beginning when you read through the Bible. And now here in the last book of the Bible, we see evidence of it again. When we repent due to the discipline, the reward the reward of turning, repenting, and change is Jesus himself. He's knocking at the door. He's ready to come in and dine with us. What a beautiful picture. Another, another beautiful reference to what was happening in that town on a daily basis. See, a lot of people from that military town of Heropolis up north that we saw earlier in that picture would come to the rich city of Laodicea and hang out. And there was a series of laws outlining behavior between a Acceptable behavior between a Roman soldier and civilians. For example, a soldier could demand a civilian like me carry his backpack for up to 1,000 paces. 
And failure to do so, it, that, to tell no, I wouldn't, that was not recommended, right? Don't do that. But as we've seen through these letters, persecution, it was all too familiar to the believers around this area. At any moment, a Roman soldier could barge through that door, come banging through that door with a list of demands. So Jesus here is telling them, I'm knocking at that door. You know, I'm not going to barge in. I'm not going to force myself upon you. I'm not going to demand something from you if you don't want to give it. I'll wait. But if you let me in, then we're going to eat together. And we're going to dine together, leisurely, together, in my presence. When we listen to discipline, fellowship with Jesus, that's the reward. And what a beautiful reward that is. My goodness. The picture of Jesus knocking at the door should remind us what a sad state of affairs this church was in. Remember, this is addressed to the church, to Christians, to believers. And Jesus wasn't even among them. He's outside knocking on the door. It would be like if you want to find Jesus this morning, he's in the parking lot. right? We put him out there, close the doors, and there he is out in the parking lot. With their focus on material things and pride, Jesus and how he wants to mold all of us into his image to serve him just got pushed out of the church somehow. It became a social club, a political entity, a place where people hang out, sing, complain. I don't know what they were doing there, but it wasn't centered on Jesus. Jesus said, I want your all and all, and they said, no way. Pushed him right out. So the real question, when you, when you look at this and think about it, though, is why hasn't he left altogether? Right? Why is he outside knocking? Why is he still offering them a seat at the table? And that's another beautiful picture of his love. It's a beautiful picture of grace. See, Christ has every right to put an end to the charade of their worship, but instead he says, I love you. I'm giving you a chance. Let me in before it's too late. My final thought here as we conclude these letters, Jesus ends with this beautiful picture of rewards. Should we be useful, not lukewarm? In this case, it's a picture of sitting with him. Did you hear that? Sitting with him, with Jesus on his throne. Can you imagine that? If we can overcome similar bad attitudes that plague the Laodiceans, if we humble ourselves, if we repent, if we live for Christ, surrender to him, then there's a great promise in store for us. And for those that overcome, the promise is that we're going to be so involved, so close to Jesus as he rules the new heavens and the new earth that we're pictured sitting with him on the throne. Not pull up a chair next to me. It said we're sitting with him on his throne. Amen to that thought. My goodness. So I thank him for leaving us with that image as we conclude our examination of these letters to the seven churches. And like those in the early church, I mean, Jesus is just encouraging us, guys, to examine ourselves, to examine corporately what we do, and to overcome so in summary, when you, when you think back to all these letters, I think they pretty much have been locked and loaded on Christians who are kind of backsliding a little bit. Would you not agree? Those who lost their first love. Those who are compromising with the world. Those who are tolerating false teachings. Those who are lukewarm like we talked about today. Those who are dead, spiritually dead, doing nothing for our Lord and his kingdom, as was the case in Sardis. And if that happens to describe, or aspects of the, this happens to describe some of us today, we just need to recenter our life around the fact that Christ loves us so, so much, that he died to save us. And he's a good master, 
He's a good, good master. His yoke is easy. His burden is light. He is our Lord. But being a Christian does not end the moment you confess that Jesus is your Lord. We know that's where it begins. So if you're a believer, if you're a Christian, it means you're a child of the king. You're a child of God. And his message to the seven churches and his message to us and probably Christians throughout all the ages would be this. You're a child of the king. Just go live like it. Just go live like it. So with that in mind, we're going to take some time to examine our heart during communion this morning. It's time to surrender all to Christ. We don't want to be lukewarm Christians. I don't want to be a lukewarm Christian. And I know I probably am in a lot of areas of my life. Right? I don't want to be that lukewarm Christian. So communion is a perfect time where we're honest with ourselves and with our Lord. And if any type of lukewarmness has crept in, then we just need to humble ourselves. We need to repent. We need to know that Christ is coming soon, and let's be sure he finds us ready. Amen? We can do it with his help and with the grace that he offers us through the power of the Holy Spirit.